everyone, this is Pastor Mike, and I'm here, believe it or not, in New Zealand with my son Brandon, and we wanted to wish you a happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Hey, Mom. Hey, Kaylee. We're having a wonderful time just driving all over, seeing God's creation. We're at a national park today, and it's just amazing. Hey, I'm so excited that Josh Ellis is there with you today to be our guest speaker. Josh is the executive director of the Union Baptist Association. The UBA is doing a great work in our city, helping plant churches and train leaders for ministry. I hope that you're gonna welcome him and make him feel at home. So thank you for this break and pray for us while we're gone. Yeah, pray for us to have safe travels and to have a great time. Uh, pray that I can get him to shave that mustache off while we're here. Pray that dad stops slowing me down on all my hikes. Pray that God will bring me closer to my son while we're away. Yeah, and pray that he brings us closer to him as we see his glory in creation. We're praying for all of you there at the brook. And now I wanna introduce a video for you about the UBA. And we wanna to say together, happy, happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Take care. This is the city. This is our city. This is you. This is me. This is us together. Put here to be used here, to make sure no one gets missed. And even though no one can be everywhere at once, together we can transform our city. Collectively, we start churches, train leaders, and reach across language barriers with the timeless message of Jesus Christ. At its core, UBA is a collaboration to empower churches, promote unity as well as diversity, and equip leaders to affect change. Through innovation, strategy, and creativity, UBA endeavors to reach every corner of the city. Because this is you, this is me, this is us, together in our city. Exactly where we are supposed to be. Put here to be used here. Together, we are UBA. Happy Father's Day weekend. So glad to be with you, and thank you for being part of the UBA family. Um, speaking of family, let's just get a couple of things out in the open. So we started, we had a song earlier, It's a Good, Good Father, and the underlying assumption of that song is that you relate to that idea of God being a good, good father, and some of that kind of depends on your own relationship with your father. And so we're going to um, explore kind of that idea tonight that God is a father and, and um, really explore that in maybe some lesser known ideas and aspects of God's character. Every preacher talks about how God is loving and all that, and we're going to go in a slightly lesser known direction. Uh, but I grew up in a broken home. My father wasn't around. We have a, a good relationship now, but I understand um, what that's like to not have a father around, and I understand what it's like to navigate those waters. And so I want you to know that I know what that's like. And so if it's a little bit tough for you to relate to the idea of God as a perfect father, um, I want us to kind of explore that idea that God is not your father. God is the ideal father, the perfect father. And so what, what does that look like? What is that like? And so tonight, I want, you to she, I want you to see my kids, because um, I think it's only fair that you see my family, uh, my wife, Valerie, and my two kids, my oldest, Gavin, my youngest, Callan. And I'm showing you not only because, I mean, aw, but uh, also <laughs> because my world changed when I became a dad. Now, that's the biggest, well, no duh, statement that you've probably ever heard. But I mean, I didn't initially want... Uh, kids. I loved kids, and, and my mom ran a daycare when I was growing up. I'm the oldest of a, a gazillion kids, and so I've been around kids my whole life. I actually relished the idea of being Uncle Fun. See, I had an uncle growing up, still have an uncle. I don't want to hear this and think I referred to him as dead, but, you know, it, you know he was the uncle who, who had a Corvette. You know, did you have that uncle? And he let me occasionally drive the Corvette, um, and so I wanted to be that uncle. I wanted to be the uncle where, you know, the kids, where I would wind them up, turn them loose, and send them home, you know? Um, I, I wanted to, you know, pay for them to do sports or go to church camp or do whatever they needed to do. I wanted to be Uncle Fun. 
And, and for a long time, my wife and I were married without kids. And then eventually my wife said, nope, it, I want our kids. And uh, so we have two boys now. And my theology, my understanding of God was opened up dramatically when I had my boys. And now I start to understand God as a father so dramatically because now I look at my boys and go, oh, I want to show my boys certain things. I want to discipline my boys when they need discipline. I want to reward my boys. I want to nurture my boys. And God wants those same things for us. It makes so much more sense to me now that I'm a parent. Because sometimes we forget that God is a dad. I mean, we talk about him being God the Father. And sometimes we baptize that language and we make it almighty theology. But sometimes we forget that God is a dad. And God wants the absolute best for his kids, even when the kids sometimes think they know what's best for themselves. So we're going to explore that territory uh, today. And so if you brought a Bible with you or you want to Google the passage, we're going to be in John chapter 17. And we're going to go through all of John chapter 17. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh gosh, the new guy, and he's going to explore a whole chapter of the Bible. Don't worry, okay? Uh, first of all, there's a countdown clock up here, uh, and I know what I'm dealing with here, all right? So second of all, um, we're not going to explore everything in John chapter 17. This is a really deep, rich chapter in the Bible, and so there's a lot of theology here, and I'm going to skip right past it. And so if this is going to tee you up with a lot of questions, um, that's the beauty of being a guest speaker. You get to just go home and leave a bunch of mess for Pastor Mike to deal with. So uh, we're just going to skip a bunch of stuff there. He'll clean it up. He's a seminary professor. It'll be fine. So um, there's a lot of stuff here that we do get to deal with. This is an intimate conversation uh, between Jesus and God the Father. And so I'm going to give you a little background. I'm going to put some of that background up on a slide here. Um, what you're seeing in John chapter 17 is a conversation between Jesus and God the Father. This is him praying on the night that he would be betrayed and turned over to the authorities to then be crucified. And so his public ministry at this point is over. There is no more teaching to be done. There's no more healing to be done. There are no more miracles to be performed. This is the end of the road. And so the other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they focus on how stressed out Jesus is at this point and, and how his disciples are supposed to be praying with him and falling asleep. And John focuses on this continuous prayer. This is the longest continuous prayer that we have recorded in the Gospels um, of Jesus. And you get a picture of Jesus having this really just down-to-earth conversation with God the Father and, and what he is concerned about. And what he's concerned about is, first of all, God's glory, and then the, the state of his disciples, the guys that he is leaving behind, and what they are going to do with the information that he gives them. And so with nothing left but to pray and then be crucified and resurrected, he starts with God's glory. And he starts there in verse 1 by saying, uh, it, it's taking over from John 16, he says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. And just real quickly, what he's talking about there is the cross. He's talking about his own crucifixion. And he has been talking about this hour of his glorification since John chapter 12. The cross glorifies Jesus. Now, the cross in human eyes, especially in Roman eyes, was, was a criminal's death. It is the ultimate degrading of humanity. It's the ultimate humiliation. And so for him to refer to this as a glorifying event really makes no sense in, in a lot of people's eyes. But for Jesus, he's saying, Father, this is for your glory. And this is going to be to my glory because it is only through the cross that Jesus can then die and then be resurrected from the dead, proving that he has conquered death and paved a way to forgive us of our sins and provide eternal life. It is only through the cross that Jesus can prove he is who he said he was. There's no other way for him to do that. 
And so even as this causes tremendous stress for him, this is the whole point of why Jesus came and lived the life that he lived. In John chapter 12, he tells his disciples that this is really stressing him out, but that this is the whole point of him living his life. It was for this particular hour. And so he continues to pray, and we're going to put a couple of verses here starting in verse 6, but I'm going to read all of John chapter 17 so you can get a feel for this long, continuous prayer. So starting again in verse 2, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I, and this is Jesus talking, glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Now notice in verse 6 right there, he says, and as he's looking back over the course of his three years in public ministry, he sums it up in this verse when he looks back and he says that I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me. When he says I have manifested your name, manifested really means displayed. And when he says I have manifested your name, what he means right there when he says name is character. And so what he's saying is, I have displayed your character to the people that you gave me out of this world. And so another way to say that is, I have modeled behavior for these disciples. And so as he is talking about this, the father plays the role of a coach. And so this is one of those lesser known attributes of God's character. Because he sent Jesus into the world to act as a coach, Jesus then turns around and coaches the disciples, and then he tells the disciples to go into the world and make more disciples. And he does that by saying, go and disciple, go and model for others how to behave. Show them how to do it. Now, I think this is an interesting instruction to dads in particular, because I was looking forward, from the time my sons were born, I wanted to coach them. You know, I played soccer growing up all the way through high school and college. I was really hoping that at least one of my sons would look forward to playing soccer. And so far, my oldest loves playing soccer. My youngest loves running around. (laughs) There's a difference. We'll see if my youngest actually likes playing soccer or if he just likes being running around. But my oldest really likes playing soccer, and I love coaching him. But just in general, regardless of the sports metaphors, dad be coaches. Christians, we are to be coaches. And this isn't like life coaches. Like, there's a difference in life coaching right now. And life coaches are when you go to someone that you're coaching and say, how do you think you should be done? How do you think this situation should be approached? And you try and coax the, the, the answer out of them. I had coaches my whole life, and never did I have a soccer coach say, how do you think this corner kick should be done? I had coaches that say, I want you to do it this way, and if you don't do it that way, you run laps. So this is the second way of coaching. When Jesus says, I want you to model behavior, he's saying, I want you to do things the way that I did things. And so go into the world and teach them to obey the things that I taught you. That may sound familiar because that comes from the last two verses in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. He says to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So you get that what I have gotten, now I am passing on to the next person. And you notice the words of Jesus here in this prayer. He says in verse 8, For I have given them the words that you gave me. It's that passing on process. Now, 
I don't know if any of you have ever been in a discipling relationship, but it's really a more mature believer taking a younger, mature, a younger believer under their wings and pouring into them not only the truth of, of the gospel and the truth of the Bible, but also the life experiences. How do you take the Bible and make it work in real life? How are these situations lived out? And so sometimes, hopefully throughout the course of your life, you're going to be in a lot of these relationships. Sometimes you are going to be the discipler, and sometimes you are going to be being discipled by someone more mature. And that is just kind of the natural process. That is how Jesus said, help the world understand who I am. Now, of course, with maturity brings perspective and knowledge. And when you're a coach, you instantly get this. You get the benefit of seeing the whole field. You get the benefit of seeing the long view. And you get the benefit of seeing that short-term pain and short-term setbacks sometimes lead to long-term benefits. You know that sometimes when you are working out, in order to build muscle, you have to be sore sometimes. In order to build endurance, you have to run long distances, and that's not always fun. And in those moments, it is tempting to think, well, this is painful. Where is God? I'm being disciplined right now. Where is God? But I want you to hear tonight, and maybe this is the reason that you're here, that just because there is pain in life doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. And sometimes it is tempting to think that God is that God sitting up on a cloud with a lightning bolt. But that's not God. That's not the God of the Bible. And, that, and God is not, he has not abandoned us and he is not looking for a reason to zap us. In fact, God weeps over us. He weeps over his kids in pain. He weeps over us when we don't get the message. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and this is documented in the Gospel of Luke, and it's, it's a big triumphal entry. We celebrate this on Palm Sunday, and he comes in at the head of this parade. If you keep reading in the Gospel of Luke past that passage, as he crests the hill and he sees the city of Jerusalem, he knows that there are so many people in Jerusalem that don't believe in him as the Messiah. They think he's some sort of political uh, savior and deliverer. They know that he knows that they don't get who he really is, and the Bible says that he weeps over Jerusalem. That is the kind of emotion that a father has for his kids. I, I had that experience when I was coaching my son Gavin when he was playing soccer. He, uh, he had to play goalie one day. And this is a couple of years ago. And my son um, is, uh, is anxious in his personality. He gets that from me. He, he wrings his hands. And if you are at the time, he was seven years old playing soccer. And on a seven-year-old soccer field, there's only one place in the whole field where everybody knows whether or not a goal is scored, and that's in the goalie. And so my son was much better off for his personality if he's not playing goalie. But, you know, everybody gets a turn, and so I'm the coach, and so I, I watch him go back to take his turn at goalie. And most teams, we dominate, and so it wasn't a big deal. His turn happened to come up when we're playing a team of, like, 12-year-olds. I mean, I swear, they're like this tall. I wanted to ask one of them for ID, and, and I, I just thought maybe they won't. It was the fourth quarter. Maybe they won't score a goal on my son because this is not going to go well. And I mean, 30 seconds in, zing, they scored a goal. And I mean, it was head high. And my, and my son, he, he didn't even look at the ball. I mean, he just froze. And then he looked over at me and just shattered and just wept. Now, I, as the coach, I know he's going to get past this, right? And I know even for the sake of our team that tends to dominate the other teams, losing an occasional game isn't the worst thing in the world, right? An occasional dose of humility can be a good thing. But the dad in me sees my little boy out there weeping in that moment of pain and, I mean, you could have just stabbed me in the heart. And he wanted no part of being on a soccer field at that moment. And so I, I go running out, because it's a seven-year-old soccer team, so you can do that. So I go running out, and he just collapses into my arms, and I pick him up, and I, I, I you know, rub his tears off. I'm like, buddy, we, you know, get back in there. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Just focus on the next one. And he kind of composes himself. And, I, and I'm thinking, I'll see you again in like 30 seconds. You know, and I go... <laughs> 
I go back out there, and I mean, sure enough, I think it was two minutes later, zing, they shoot another laser past him, you know, and mercilessly, you know, another five minutes go by. And, you know, and two goals in, I'm ready to go have words with the other coach because, you know, my dad hackles are getting raised here. Eventually, we get past that game. But, you know, those are the emotions of a dad. And the thing about that is I had the benefit of the long view, but it still killed me to see my kids in pain. It kills God to see his kids in pain. You need to know that about God's character. You know, God doesn't delight in his kids being in pain. God is a loving God. We're not going to lose sight of that. But God also wants for us to take refuge in him. And that's that second aspect. And you can see this coming out in this prayer here in verse 10. And you'll see some of these verses on the screen. Verse 10, Jesus says, All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, and they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, that these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves." Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Every time you see that word sanctify or the word consecrate, that's the same word in Greek. And it's that word to make holy or to set apart. And so in verse 17 where it says, sanctify them in the truth, that is set them apart, make them holy in the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the word, world, so I have sent them into the world, verse 19, and for their sake, I set them, I set myself apart. I made myself holy, that they also may be set apart, made holy in the truth. The process of following Jesus is not always going to be fun, popular, or understood. But this is the coach saying to us that in this process, it's going to be hard. You're going to need a refuge. You're going to need a place of shelter. You're going to need a safe place. And that safe place is him. That safe place is daddy God. And that we can't manufacture that feeling of safety, that feeling of refuge. We can't do that for ourselves. We need to take shelter in him. We need to take refuge in him. My oldest son, Gavin, used to be freaked out on on trains. He loved trains, loved to play on trains, loved to talk about trains. He even liked to go to the train show at the George R. Brown Convention Center downtown and see the Lego trains, like loved everything about trains except being on them. And so when we go to Colorado twice a year, because that's where I'm from, there there is an underground shuttle in between the terminals at the Denver International Airport. The most terrifying moment, three minutes of that kid's life. You know, it was between the terminal and the baggage claim. And when he was young, and we're talking like two, three, up to probably four years old, he possessed superhuman koala bear strength because we would get on there and he would wrap his arms around me, bury his face in the scruff of my neck and just say, no, no, off, off, get off, off, no, no, off. You know, and and there, there was... You know, for one, I hate that because he's really freaked out. Now, he was never going to scream. He's not making a commotion. In fact, everybody on the train is like, oh, that's so sweet. You know, and, and even me, I'm like, you know, there's going to be a day when he doesn't want to hug daddy this hard. So this isn't the worst three minutes in my life. You know what I'm saying? But for him, I was the safest place in the world. You know, and, and not for nothing, but nine times out of ten, those boys want mom. But for some reason, on modes of transportation, they want me. 
And no, no kidding, on a Southwest Airline flight, we got three seats on this side and three seats on that side. My wife gets a cup of coffee and her phone, and she gets the one chair on that side, and dad gets the boys on that side. Because I don't know why, but on a mode of transportation, like if the plane is going down, they want to be sitting next to dad. I don't know what it is. But he's on that train, and he's just like off, 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 and he's clutching me with that superhuman koala bear strength. And as soon as that train comes to a halt, boom, back to normal, up the escalators, and off to see Nana. Okay. Dad is the refuge. And so I would say to all the dads out there, are you a refuge? Are you a refuge for your kids? Do you hug your kids enough? Probably not enough, but do you hug your kids? Are you a safe place for them? God wants to be our refuge. He knows that there are going to be times when we're scared, when we're confused, when we're depressed, when we're disappointed. He knows those times are coming. And while he doesn't enjoy seeing us in pain, he wants to see us take refuge in him because he knows the end of the pain is in sight. He knows that sometimes pain is self-inflicted, sometimes it's unwarranted, sometimes it's massive, all-consuming, life-altering, and it's the ultimate expression of a broken world. He knows that he is the source of security and peace and that holding on tightly to him is extremely productive. He wants to meet that need just like every good dad wants to hold his kids. He wants to hold his kids. He also wants to hold them together. He wants to hold us together because the father is the unifier. He's the coach. He's the refuge. And he's the unifier. Because teams are formed when they share common experiences, good and bad. And Jesus isn't just coaching his disciples. He's also praying for them. He's not just modeling behavior for them. He's praying for them. And he's not just praying for them. He's praying for the future them. He's not just praying for his team. He's praying for the future of his team. He says in verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, and they may be become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know you that, have sent, that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. You know, my kids, my son's soccer team was learning to pass this year. And um, that's a tricky concept for eight and nine-year-olds because eight and nine-year-olds get the concept of yelling, I'm open, because they're always open, right? Or they think they're always open. And they get the concept of give me the ball. What they don't get the concept of is running to a position that makes it easy for their teammates to pass them the ball. And so I found myself this year saying a lot, make life better for your teammates. And I would say that to eight and nine-year-olds, make life better for them. Make it easy for them to pass you the ball. And so teaching them to be better teammates was kind of the next step in the evolution. They get that they have a place on the team. They get that they have skills that they bring to the team. This year was teaching them to be part of the team and to care for their teammates. And Jesus right here is saying, I'm not just praying for these disciples. I'm praying for the disciples that they're going to make and the disciples that they're going to make. And I'm praying that they would be one. I'm praying that they would be unified. Have you ever seen kids misbehaving somewhere and wondered, whose kids are those? Have you ever wondered who was wondering that about your kids? Or is that just me? That just happens to me? There's a verse in John 13, 34 and 35. says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, 
everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What that means is the world is going to know that we're Jesus followers by how we treat one another. It's not by the sermons. It's not by the Bible studies. It's not by the home groups. It's not by anything else. The world's going to know that we follow Jesus by how we love one another, by how unified our team is. Unity starts at the home. Is your family a team? Dad, is your family a team? Is this church unified? Are you playing a unifying role on this team? And are you helping unify the body of Christ? Because remember, a team that is unified accomplishes its goals. That's the only way teams work. Individual players may do okay for teams, but when a team starts to look out for each other, that's when a team starts to accomplish its goal. And so interesting to me that Jesus builds those principles into the scriptures so many thousands of years or hundreds of years before we ever start talking about team dynamics. He's saying, look, we need unity in the body in order to accomplish our goals. And remember, our goals is what? To go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And so if the team is going to accomplish its goal, we need to be unified. If the, the world is going to know that Jesus came to be glorified on the cross, if it's going to know that there is grace and mercy and love waiting for it, if, if the world would just trust Jesus with their life, they're going to learn that from us. They're going to learn that by our coaching. They're going to learn that by how we offer refuge. And they're going to learn that by how unified we are. And so I'm going to show you these reflection questions, and then I'm going to pray. And these are pretty simple reflection questions. The first is, have I accepted the gift of new life in Christ? This might be the time that you say, okay, I've been fooling with it, but I haven't ever trusted Jesus with my life. That means you've been working your own angle, you've been trying to provide refuge for yourself, peace for yourself, but I've never trusted Jesus to provide those things for me. Maybe tonight is that night. Do I need to be in a coaching relationship? Maybe you need to be discipling someone. Maybe someone needs to be discipling you. When was the last time that you found refuge in God? When was the last time that you curled up on Daddy God's lap and said, mm, I need to just rest here? And where can I be proactive in bringing the body of Christ together? There are people in this church that will help you answer these questions. And so if one of these or several of these questions resonate with you, I would really encourage you to reach out to someone in this church and say, I need help answering this question. Would you do that? And I know that they will. So let me pray for you. Father God, I am so grateful that you, in addition to being the almighty Father, that you are Daddy God and that you are the best Father, that we could possibly imagine, that you are the ideal dad. And Lord, I am reminded just this week of a good friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, that his father passed away after a long, faithful life, but he's in pain this week. And Lord, a lot of us have had difficult relationships with our earthly fathers. Some have lost their earthly fathers this year. So Lord, I'm just motivated to pray for a sense of peace for them. Holy Spirit, you are the comforter, and so Lord, comfort them. Be all the things that they need in this moment and the many moments to come. And Lord Jesus, in these next couple of moments, would you do what you do? Would you provide direction? Would you provide a sense of conviction where we need conviction? Would you provide a sense of direction and show us, Lord, maybe it is that we need to trust you more. We need to take refuge in you. We need to take the initiative to disciple someone else to share the gospel with someone else, 
to enter into a discipling relationship with someone that is more mature in the faith than we are to learn from their expertise and their experience. Lord, whatever it is that you are doing in our midst, Lord, we give you the glory because it's not about us, it's about you. And so, Father, I pray for everyone within the hearing of my voice, Lord, that you would be glorified in this time. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.